In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. They were hiding inexplicably. They tried to hide from God because the devil had done his worst and his worst was bad. Like a strong man, he had come in and he had taken over the house and claimed everything in the house as his own. Adam and Eve who had not a want in the world, had suddenly been convinced that they were lacking something. Somehow they were convinced that this God who had had formed them out of the dust of the earth with his own hands and had breathed into them the breath of life and, and who loved them and cared for them and blessed them and provided everything they could ever need, Somehow they were convinced that that God was holding out on them, that he was holding back on them, holding back real love from them. He did it with a lie, if you remember the words just before our reading from Genesis. With with a blatant lie. You will not surely die when you eat this fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that God told you very clearly. When you eat of it, you will surely die. He did it with a half-truth, too. He, he told them, um, when you eat of it, you're going to be like God, knowing both good and evil. The half-truth was that they would know good and evil. They already knew the good. They knew the perfect. They knew the glory of God. But they were going to know the evil then. But they weren't going to be like God. They would be lost to him. The devil did his worst. He led Adam and Eve to doubt the love of God, to desire what was forbidden to them and to disobey, to eat the fruit that God told them, do not eat it. It, The devil did his worst, and although it doesn't seem like much, like it shouldn't have much of an effect, it was simply eating some fruit. It shouldn't have destroyed all that much. The devil did his worst, And he accomplished his desire of of dividing the people from their God. Instead of running to the God who loved them when this thing had gone wrong, when this strange thing had happened, instead of running to the God who loved them, whom they knew loved them, they ran away from and tried to hide in fear from the God from whom they had become estranged. The devil had done his worst. He had created enmity. That strange sounding word. The the, the status of being an enemy between the people and their God. How else do you explain what they did? When trouble comes, you don't run away from your friends. You don't run away from your father who loves you. When trouble comes, you run away in fear from the one that you consider to be your enemy because you fear that they're coming to destroy you. And so Adam and Eve hid. They seemed content to to live in their guilt and their shame forever apart from their God. The devil had done his worst and his worst was bad. And yet, when we hear in these words, we don't hear about the God who decided, all right, this has failed. I'm coming down to destroy these two. I'll start over again with somebody that's going to obey me. Instead, we find a God who is unwilling to let them live apart from him and be destroyed forever. A God who is unwilling to see them be destroyed. And so what does God do? He comes seeking them. And calling out to them, where are you? More of an existential question than a literal question. God didn't, it wasn't as if God couldn't find them. He knew exactly where they were and what they had done. He asked the question for Adam and Eve's benefit, not for his own. He gives them this opportunity to come to him in repentance and cry out for forgiveness. This existential question. What have you done? Where are you with me? 
And since their first attempt to fix the problem of guilt and sin, the problem of this falling into temptation had failed, trying to hide from God didn't work, God had found them, they, they tried all the other methods of trying to deal with this guilt and shame. Adam, obviously, points the finger of blame someplace else. The woman, she gave me some fruit and I ate it. And actually, it, it's, it's her. She's the one. But if you think about it enough, God, you're the one. You put her here. She gave it to me and I ate. It's not my fault. And Eve, well, she doesn't get any better. It, maybe I did it, but it, I, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And in so many words... She's the first one to be able to claim, even though it doesn't hold water, the excuse, the devil made me do it. Neither of of these ways of trying to deal with this shame and sin was going to work. The devil had done his worst. And just look what it accomplished. They'd gone from perfection, complete, perfect unity with God to being as far away from God and separated from God as far as one could possibly get. Martin Luther, when he would preach and teach on on these verses from Genesis, he had this to say. He said, This is what sin is like. This is the very nature of sin. He said, unless God immediately provides a cure and calls the sinner back, that sinner is going to flee endlessly from God. They'll never turn around and look to to get back with God. Unless the sinner, that sinner will endlessly flee flee from God and by excusing their sin with lies, they heap up sin upon sin until they arrive at blasphemy and despair. What else can you call that? Trying to, to excuse sin with more sin and, and even this sin of blasphemy, calling God the, the reason and the origin of this sin. It's you who did this, not me. We can understand the way that Adam and Eve are acting because their way of dealing with this is really not that much different from our way of dealing with our guilt and shame and sin. Are you a hider? You have something, it's a, it's a preference of yours, a, a, a priority of yours that you know doesn't match up with God's word. And so, and so you're here in, in God's house this morning, but have there been times in your life when you have found yourself just finding all the excuses you needed not to come and be in God's house on a Sunday morning? You, you hide from God because you don't want to show your face in his presence. You don't want to hear what he has to say. We hide from God sometimes by trying to redefine what God's will is. (laughs) I know that used to be wrong, God. It's okay now, and therefore I can somehow salve my guilty conscience by hiding in semantics and definitions. Find ourselves like Adam, passing the blame. I know, I did it, but it's it's not my fault. It's my parents' fault, the way that they raised me. It's society's fault. It's the demands that society has on me as a man or a woman or a young person. The things that I'm supposed to want, if I don't get these things, I'm just going to fall behind. It's not my fault. It's society's fault. Or it's the government's fault. Everything's the government's fault. The wicked, evil government's fault. That's them, not me. I'm innocent. We try to hide. We try to pass the blame Maybe you're somebody that does a good job of rationalizing, explaining away with reason, like Eve. We think to ourselves, if I can, if I can find a good explanation for the why, well, then maybe I'll be excused for the what that I've done. Like if if you were there, Lord, if you if you knew what was going on, well, then you'd see that I have no other choice but to hate her. No other choice but to want this thing that I don't have. If we can explain the why, maybe we can, maybe we can be excused for the what. No, none of these things are, are going to deal with the shame and the guilt and the sin that we have. And yet, just like with Adam and Eve, 
We have a God who's unwilling to let us just continue hiding, explaining, staying away from him. He comes seeking the lost to find and to promise a Savior in Jesus Christ. He comes to us. He, he did it this morning for us. He comes as we stand in his house and he says, where are you? Well, I'm right here, Lord. Nah, where are you? And what do we do immediately? We say, ah, therefore, let us confess our sins to the Lord. Let us not try to explain or hide or rationalize. Let us just tell him. Lord, I've, what have we done? Uh, Lord, we've, we've done these things. We've, we've failed to do these things. We've, we've failed to obey your will and your law. I've strayed from your way. I've offended you. I've done the things that you say I shouldn't have done. I haven't done the things that I should have done. Lord, have mercy on me. And look at what God does. We worship this way almost every time we come into God's house. We have this opportunity to lay this guilt and sin at the foot of our Savior's cross and then hear the message that gives life and forgiveness to broken hearts. And look at just how patiently and lovingly and gently our God dealt with Adam and Eve in their stubbornness too. See, we call this section of Scripture in Genesis chapter 3, we call it the fall. Yeah, and so we, are, we think about what Adam and, Eve, Adam and Eve did to ruin everything for us. And our attention is drawn almost necessarily to, to the image of Satan appearing as a serpent slithering through the garden and tempting our first parents into sin. We think of Adam and Eve and the serpent for what they do, but this this account in the scriptures is all about the God of faithful love. The one who comes and instead of destroying those that deserve it, he comes willing to save, willing to show mercy, willing to call to repentance and rescue and redeem all that is precious to him, you and me included. The devil does his worst. But as we see and hear again and again in the scriptures, Jesus always wins. Right away, we hear these words. As we know that there are more words after this that are going to be spoken to Adam and Eve. Some of the consequences, earthly consequences of sin. Eve would have pain in childbirth. Adam would have difficulty growing food. But first, you, God says to the serpent. And when he speaks to him, in, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the first word in the Hebrew uh, sentence here is enmity. I'm putting enmity back where it belongs. You sought to put enmity, a state of enemies, between my people and me. And you succeeded in making them enemies of one another. But I am going to put enmity where it back, back where it belongs. Between you and my people. Between you and your evil angels and your offspring and my people. And there is going to become a, a descendant, a seed of this woman, an offspring of this woman. He's going to come and he's going to put enmity back where it belongs for good. He will crush your head. You, as we heard in that reading from Genesis chapter, or from Revelation 12, you and your power will be hurled down. You and your work of enmity will be destroyed. We read these words and we understand them to be the very, we call it the pro. Evangelium, the very first giving of the promise of the gospel, the promise of the Redeemer, the Savior, the Rescuer, the Messiah. And already we know, even though difficulty will come, even though this devil still has a certain amount of power, even though he will still tempt, even though he will do his worst, we already know this Messiah, this Savior, will win, and he'll win for us. He will remove this enmity between God and his people. Because of God's love, he will come and crush your head, Satan, and you will strike his heel. See, only God could remove this enmity and put it back where it belongs. But it was going to cost. 
It wasn't going to cost the, the, the man and his wife. It wasn't really going to, to be something that the devil was going to try and do. God had to do this, and it would come at a cost. The, the Old Testament, God prefigured this, taught his people about how this was going to happen and what it was going to look like. He gave them uh, wonderful things that taught them. We call it the great day of atonement. In the Old Testament, when the, the high priest wanted to go into the holy place one day a year, there would be sacrifices made, blood sacrifices, animals that were slain and put on the altar as sin offerings. And then the high priest would take blood into the holy place and he would sprinkle blood on the atonement cover of the, of the Ark of the Covenant. Just to show the, the way that people are reunited back with their God comes at a cost. Death is necessary. And then he would come out with those bloody hands and he would place them on a goat. And he would confess the sins of the people over that goat. And they would send that goat off into the desert, that scapegoat to carry away the guilt and the shame and the sin of the people. God taught his people about this with the Passover lamb. It's the only way you are going to be spared from death is the blood of the innocent lamb that will die in your place. All of these things point forward to the the real lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. The one who carried that sin on himself all the way to the cross to remove that enmity between God and man. Our Savior Jesus took that sin upon himself and on the cross, you can see this in the Good Friday account. The sky turns dark. He cries out from the cross, my God, my God, he could say, why is there enmity between me and you? There shouldn't be. And the answer, if there was one from heaven, would be because you are carrying that enmity. You are carrying that guilt and sin for all of them. Your guilt, your sin, and mine. And when Jesus cried out from the cross, it is finished. This is done. This enmity between God and his people, that's coming to an end right here. Because this blood is enough to pay for it. This blood is enough to cleanse all of you. This enmity comes to an end right now. And so, with his, with his death, do you remember what happens on that Good Friday? It seems like such an inconsequential little side thing that happens. Enmity is gone. So the curtain that separated the holy place, the most holy place in the temple, from the rest of the place where God's people will come to worship, this, the, this curtain that separated the people from their God, it was torn in two from top to bottom when Jesus died. No longer are you not my people. You are my people. You are washed clean. Your guilt is paid for. Your conscience is clean. The devil does his worst. Jesus always wins. He did this for you. So if when, the, when, when the devil comes in and he rightly accuses you because I might not know all the stuff, but you do. You know the things that you have done, loveless things that you've done in hurting the people that you're supposed to love that are close to you things that no one else is aware of, things that no one ever is going to find out about, but, but God doesn't. So the devil comes along and he accuses you. Your own conscience accuses you and, and you cry out, Lord, have mercy. Remember this. We hear those words of forgiveness. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. He sent Jesus Christ to be your Redeemer and your Savior Jesus paid the penalty for your guilt with his death on the cross. Jesus freed you from the fear of death by his resurrection from the grave. This, is, this account just tells us everything about the character and content and way that our God is. He doesn't come in looking to destroy. He comes willing and eager to save everyone. And so he provides this way for everyone who has ever been born and everyone who ever will be born to be saved from destruction and sin and death. 
The devil did his worst, and Jesus always wins. Jesus comes in and he tied up that strong man who had, who had taken over the house at the beginning because Jesus is the stronger man. Jesus came to destroy the devil's work and he always wins. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. Yes, the devil and his allies are constantly doing their worst, and they still will. And their work always brings pain. But as children of God, we keep this in mind, and it brings us our comfort. Jesus always wins, and his victory is ours. His victory is ours. <laughs> By the blood of the Lamb, we've been redeemed and forgiven. By the testimony of the gospel that proclaims to you again and again who you belong to now, who your strong man is, and what he has done for your life. May God grant us this, this wonderful confidence that even though the devil does his worst, Jesus always wins. May this be ours in Jesus' name. Amen. Now the peace